let's start this way with uh, the making of a scientist. I'd like you to go back to the text, please. And the very first paragraph where it says, before I was born, let's just count down. The second paragraph, does everybody have the first paragraph? The second paragraph begins with then after a while. And the third paragraph begins with but my father said. And I'd like you to reread to yourselves carefully and quietly to yourselves those first three paragraphs, please. I work as a literacy consultant for grades K to 12 in Vermont. I've also been working the last uh, three years or so with the standards and with the Common Core. And I come to this school roughly once a month to work with, with different teachers. Before today's lesson, the teacher had read aloud the entire, the entire text of, of the Feynman piece with the students following along in the text. And then after that, the students had read it on their own. And then the teacher had gone over some vocabulary. Today was actually only the second lesson with this piece. In your groups, find in the text what the mother says and then what the father says. And you can underline it or highlight it. What does the mother say? And then what does the father say? Anybody want to say, what does the mother say? Yes? The, the mother say, no, I mean, leave the poor child alone. Okay, does everybody see? Let's, let's all follow that together now. Let's follow along with where the father says. No, I want to show him what patterns are like and how interesting they are. It's a kind of elementary mathematics. So he started very early to tell me about the world and how interesting it is. Now, this is a little trickier. Who is saying that? Who is saying, so he started very early to tell me about the world and how interesting it is? Talk about that in your group for a second. I think it's the child because I think the child is the narrator. Yeah, that's what I think too. So if we look at that sentence, so he started very early to tell me about the world and how interesting it is. The question is, who's the he and who's the me? Who's the he and who's the me? Um, the he is the father and the me is the child. Right. The he is the father. The child is Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, the scientist, is the child. He is Richard Feynman's father. What I'd like you to do now is... Reread these three paragraphs that you've just read very carefully to yourselves. And then I'd like you to answer the question, what, was, what lesson was the father trying to teach Richard Feynman with the tiles? He was using the tiles to teach Richard Feynman a lesson. What was the lesson he was trying to teach Richard Feynman with the tiles. Well, don't answer it now. I'd like you to reread it and then talk about it in group and then we'll get some answers. And you're doing fabulous. There are a number of pieces essential to the common core that you could see in this lesson. First and foremost, text evidence. As often as possible, after every question, students are looked to go in, back into the text, find the evidence for their answers. So he could take bathroom tiles and he could make them into different coordinations so that he could see like what the patterns what different patterns he could make and things like that. Who would like to address this question of what was the lesson? About the patterns, so different colors and all that. Right. He was teaching patterns. Anybody want to add to that? Um, he was trying to get him interested in logic and things at an early age, so maybe he would will become interested in it and be a scientist like his dad wanted him to. Very good. He might have been trying to teach him about logic at an early age. Okay. Anybody want to add? Um, he was also teaching him about colors um, and numbers because there could be two of the purple and two of the red at the same time, and they could like be mixing, counting the colors, and like knowing what the co teaching him the names of the colors. So we have colors, patterns, and logic. Anybody want to add anything? Maybe he was teaching him like how to think like a scientist, because like usually scientists would think about like how to set things up in certain ways so that it would work for them. Very good. So we got a lot of things now: logic, patterns, maybe colors, numbers, how to think like a scientist because scientists set things up. Anybody want to add anything? 
maybe he was teaching um, his, his son about shapes. Shapes. Could be shapes. I think the tiles were all one shape, but I'm not sure, actually. It doesn't say in the text that the tiles were all one shape. Excellent work on that. Now, what I'd like you to do is paragraph four begins with, we had the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica at home. I'd like you to reread that paragraph, and when you're finished, look up, and I'm going to ask you a question about it. There's a very small word in the middle of that paragraph. It's in the sentence that says, we would be reading say about dinosaurs. Now, this is a hard question because it's a tiny word, only has three letters, but it tells you something about what's happening. What does that mean when it says, we would be reading say about dinosaurs? And think what an encyclopedia is. He was shown out an example so his son could get smarter over the over the years. He was showing an example about his son to get smarter. That's true. That's what he was doing. But what does that little word S-A-Y mean? Does an encyclopedia tell you about one thing or a lot of things? A lot of things. That's a hint. So then the word say tells you that they were discussing what? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, right. Because they could have been discussing in an encyclopedia, they could have been discussing snakes, they could have been discussing spacecraft, they could have been discussing mountains, because all those things are in an encyclopedia. But when it says we would be reading say about dinosaurs, then it's an example, as you said, as you said originally. Now let's take a look at paragraph five. I'd like you to read paragraph five again to yourself, please, and then look up and I'll ask you a question about it. Now, in that paragraph, it says the second sentence. It says, now that would mean if he stood in our front yard, he would be tall enough. What, what does he mean in the sentence so far? The dinosaurs. If he stood in our front yard, he would be tall enough to put his head through our window up here. We were on the second floor but his head would be too wide to fit in the window. Why was Feynman's father telling him, telling him that? Why was he giving him those examples? Um, maybe to give him a realistic explanation about how tall the dinosaur would be. And maybe the father set it up as like a comparison so he could see exactly how tall they would be. Very good. Now, this last sentence is very important. Everything he read to me, he would translate as best he could into some reality. Take a talk for a second with your group, for a few moments with your group. First, let's start with, well, what do you think that sentence means? Everything he, talk in your group, everything he read to me, he would translate as best he could into some reality. About the dinosaur, he might want to know, like, more about how tall it is and he can put it into reality so that he can understand more about it maybe he was trying to like explain it with a with something that was more like in real life instead of just saying that it's that tall maybe he was just trying to explain to his son like how big it would be and how wide his head would be very good a piece like Feynman for fifth grade would likely be worked on for five days 35, 45 minutes each, each period. And that would possibly include the culminating activity, which is a writing activity. And it might even go a little bit over, but you, you can think roughly five, roughly five days, each day a 40, 45 minute period. What do you think the word magnitude means in that first sentence? It is, was very exciting and very, very interesting to think there were animals of such magnitude. What do you think? Take a guess. Um, maybe it means with power. Power. Very good. Let's keep that in our minds. Power. Yes. Size. Size. Very good. Anybody want to add to that? Power and size is great. What else could it possibly be? After all, these animals, it says, if it says in the text, they all died out and that nobody knew why. So that means it's kind of a what? Mystery. Perfect. So there's power, there's ability, and there's mystery. If you add all of those up, power, ability, and mystery, the dinosaurs were pretty important to scientists. They had tremendous power, they had ability, they, they had tremendous size, and it was a mystery how they died. So magnitude 
is a very, uh, very important word. It means size and importance. To scientists, the dinosaurs were important. The Common Core Standards Privilege Vocabulary academic vocabulary, the types of words that are not restricted to any one domain, such as physics, chemistry, or zoology, or literature, but could appear in any domain. Words such as several, variable, instantaneous, reciprocal, that could appear anywhere in academic text, but tends to appear more in informational text. Okay, you are doing great. The last sentence of this paragraph, I'd like you to read it to yourselves and then talk what do you think it means? But I learned from my father to translate. I said that translate means like every time when he reads something, he'd try to make it realistic. Like kind of imagine like he's in it. Yeah. Okay, good. good. Like in some books, they would, like it would, it would like in the dragon wing, it would be, the author would make it so it feels like you're right into the book. Yeah, it's like you can draw a clear picture right in your mind. And would that be true for a book that is true as well as a book that's made up? Yes. One highlight was when the three boys in the in the corner of the room were really trying to wrestle with the idea of what is fine what did Feynman mean when he said, I try to translate everything I, I read into into the real world, into really understanding. And they talked about it. And then they expressed it to the, to the whole group. And it was a highlight, especially because all three of those, all three of those children are on an IEP for language, for language processing issues. So for them to have to wrestle with an idea as complex as translating ideas that you read into a reality that you understand, to wrestle with it first on their own, and then after they kind of get it, and then be asked to say it again to the whole class, that, that was definitely a highlight of that, of that lesson. What Richard Feynman was trying to say here, what he was doing is exactly what we are doing with close reading. When we do this, a close reading, we've spent almost 40 minutes on one page and you've read it and you've talked about, you've read some of it, you've read it before. A close reading is when we try to understand in a realistic way that we can picture in our mind everything the author is saying. And what Richard Feynman is saying is whenever he reads something, whenever he reads something, he tries to translate it, to change it into something in his mind that he understands a little bit or a lot. What do you think? A lot. Something he really understands a lot about. That's what we do. That's what we do with close reading. We try to understand completely what the author is saying. And you've been doing a really good job of it. Okay, turn to the next page, please. Feynman's father is teaching him another lesson now about, about the world or about birds, but maybe more than birds. And what is the lesson that, father, that Feynman's father is teaching him in this paragraph? And so talk about it in your group and see if you can find some evidence in the text. Yeah, I think the father is teaching his son that you don't really want to be competitive and think that you know everything because you don't. He's trying to teach him that you can know the name of the bird in a bunch of different languages like Portuguese and stuff. But in the end, you really just know about what people call the bird in different languages. You don't know anything about the bird. It's like... You can call it the hot dog warbler, and, but people don't think that's interesting. It's just you never really know what it does. You just know that somewhere someone calls it the hot dog warbler. Very good. I was going to say, can anybody add to that? But I think you got it. It's not what the animal is called that's important. It's what it does, D-O-E-S. Very, very good. The kinds of questions, the kinds of very um, close-knit, close-reading, text-based questions that I asked today, would continue for the for the, roughly the next half of the uh, of the text. That would be followed, possibly. That would include some work on vocabulary, the words that can be determined from from context, and that would be followed by preparing the students for the culminating activity. You did really, really well. You should be very, very impressed. And I love the way you you talk to each other. You talk about the text. You go back to the text, you underline it, you highlight it, you use the text for your evidence. Um, and my final thought is that you're really, really fun to teach. Thank you very much.